Good morning from Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Anwar Bukharis, uh, and I am a professor of counterterrorism and countering violent extremism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, I want to extend a very, warm, very warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni, distinguished colleagues and friends who have joined us today for this webinar on implementing regional strategies to counter violent extremism and terrorism. Uh, we are pleased to once again partner with the African Center for the Study uh, and Research on Terrorism, CAIRT, for this event. And CAIRT's acting director, Idris Lailali, is here with us, and he will be the moderator of today's webinar. Uh, Mr. Lailali has had a distinguished career, and among his many responsibilities are leading the design and development of CAIRT's counterterrorism early warning system and managing a team of analysts who conduct policy analysis, studies, uh, synthesis, and audits on terrorism in Africa. Uh, Mr. Lalali previously provided assistance to consultants appointed by the African Union to the African Anti-Terrorist Model Law. He managed the focal point community database, and he led the monitoring process of ratification of the African and Universal Counterterrorism Instruments. And Mr. Lalali currently leads a team of experts who evaluate the counterterrorism capacity of African Union member states. And now I would like to pass it over to Idris Lalali. Mr. Alali. Uh, thank you, Anwar. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, we are uh, um, honestly warm by your participation and interest in today's topic. Um, and we hope to continue to be of service to uh, you in similar conversations in the future. Allow me, first of all, uh, to say that indeed we are the African Union uh, technical arm and research institution on terrorism, and we are therefore indeed honored and privileged to be joining efforts again with the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in organizing another webinar on thematics uh, that concern Africa and African security. Um, today's webinar, dear participants, uh, is indeed uh, an important topic uh, or on the important topic of implementing regional strategies to countering violent extremism, violent and, and terrorism. It provides an opportunity to take stock of lessons learned from two regional organizations or regional organizations, namely SADAC and ECOWAS, that are implementing regional strategies to counter violent extremism and, and terrorism. So without a further ado, since I'm the moderator, uh, Dr. Anwar, if you allow me to give the floor to Kate uh, to say a few words, and then I can come back and, and take over. Thank you very much. Good morning, Kate. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, Idris, uh, to Anwar, to all of our distinguished colleagues who have joined us uh, from both the Kayarta community and the Africa Center alumni community. Uh, allow me to welcome you uh, as well and uh, to say thank you uh, for joining us for this conversation today. Uh, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies is uh, delighted to, to continue to partner with Kayart uh, on these important uh, topics and discussions uh, through the webinars uh, that uh, we're able to join together on. The Africa Center serves as a forum for research, for academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a U.S. Department of Defense regional center located at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., and we carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships and catalyzing strategic solutions. And so we very much look forward to this conversation today uh, to continue to do all of these things uh, uh, together uh, with all of you who have joined us online as we consider regional strategies in the ECOWAS and the SADAC regions. And thank you to our uh, distinguished panelists uh, for being with us uh, to help us uh, uh, unpack uh, this important uh, topic uh, and see how we can uh, together further advance our collective objectives uh, to counter and prevent violent extremism in Africa. Thank you, uh, uh, Idris, back to you. Thank you very much, Kate, thank you. So uh, again, uh, very good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Um, you know, today's topic has two objectives. One is greater understanding of the basic common principles and practices that have guided the development of both regional strategies, uh, ECOWAS and SADAC, to countering violent extremism and terrorism. 
the second objective is to gain insights on the key obstacles to implementation of regional strategies and how to overcome them. Uh, as you would notice, we have a very excellent lineup of speakers uh, from across the continent. I would like to welcome Ms. Angelberta Maria Christine, Dr. Abdurrahman Jeng, and my dear friend and Dr. Hussein uh, Suleiman. Uh, we look indeed to your talk and engagement. As you would agree with me, uh, this webinar is very timely, as we are reminded on a daily basis by terrorist attacks of the relevance of the topic. In a way, we want to continue to maintain our relevance to our stakeholders, to our communities, and to our governments in, in uh, arranging this kind of platforms with speakers of your caliber who are able to impact and influence positively public policy in more ways than, a, than one. Having said that, uh, now allow me to introduce today's panelists to the uh, participants uh, to uh, this webinar. Ms. Angelberta Maria Kirsten, uh, that you see on the screen, is an analyst for political and security threats at the Regional Early Warning Center, RUC. Uh, she's in SADC, uh, at the SADC Secretariat. And she's been uh, you know, at the RUCs since March 2018. She serves as a focal point on issues of terrorism and violent extremism and related matters. And I have a pleasure of being in contact with her uh, on a continuous basis. She's, she is the focal point to uh, Kayet also. She liaises with national early warning centers, the NUCs, and national counterterrorism center in member states of uh, the SADC region and beyond. She has completed postgraduate diploma in security and strategic studies at the University of Namibia, baccalaureus technologia in policing at University of South Africa, a national diploma in police science at uh, Polytechnique of Namibia 2012. Uh, we also have our dear colleague, brother Abdurrahman Jeng, uh, who is the head of the Regional Security Division at ECOWAS Commission. Uh, he uh, accumulates over 15 years of experience working at the ECOWAS Commission. From September 28, uh, 2008 sorry, to the present day, he has been permanent secretary of the West African Police Chiefs Committee. He is cumulatively the head of maritime security, uh, safety, sorry, and security, counterterrorism, security sector and defense reforms, and fight against transnational organized crime, as well as coordinator of the ECOWAS Committee of Chiefs of Security Intelligence Services, a focal point for the Gulf of Guinea Interregional uh, Network, uh, West Africa Police Information System, WAPIS, and support to the West African Integrated Maritime Security. We're really privileged with all you know, these responsibilities that you found time, Dr. Jane, to be part and, uh, and attending this meeting. We're very grateful to that, sir. Uh, previously, he was legal advisor for the Ministry of Armed Forces of Senegal and director of training at the Gendarmerie School. He holds a PhD in uh, political science and other postgraduate degrees on law, strategy, and security studies from the University of Sheikh Anta Diop of Dakar, Senegal, and the uh, Nasarawa State University of Kifi, uh, Nigeria. Uh, we also have um, our dear brother, Dr. Uh, Hussein Suleiman, who holds a, a doctorate in literature and philosophy, political science from the University of South Africa. Currently, he's senior professor and academic head of department in the Department of Political Studies and Governance, the University of Free State. He, his previous sorry, appointments include being executive director of the International Institute of Islamic Studies, Professor and Director of the Center for International Political Studies, University of Pretoria, Research Manager at the African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes, Senior Researcher, uh, Western Cape. Uh, he was also Visiting Professor, Visiting Senior Fellow, Senior Associate and Chair of African Studies at many universities and institutes, including the Osaka School of International Public Policy, the Global Collaboration Center at Osaka University, the Jamhalal Nehru University in New Delhi, and I do apologize if I mispronounced that, uh, Department of War Studies at King's College University in London, the Security Institute for Governance and Leadership in Africa, SIGLA, uh, in uh, Stellenbosch, and that's where we met uh, the first time, Dr. Solomon, if you remember, a few years back, thanks to, uh, to ACSS also, the London School of Economics and Political Science in the UK, and as senior analyst uh, for New York-based Wikistrat. 
So that brings the end of the introductions and uh, allow me, you know, to jump straight into the conversations. So, um, Angelberta, let me start with you. Uh, what is the overall objective of the regional counterterrorism strategy for uh, Southern Africa? More specifically, how uh, was that strategy developed? How were the key goals and objectives identified? And, you know, finally, who was involved in the process and how? So over to you, Angelberta. You have seven minutes. So each question will have seven minutes answers. And, uh, and then this will allow us some space for the participants to also, uh, you know, interact with us. So over to you, Angelberta. Thank you very much, um, Idris, um, for the introduction. And I want to let me at the onset thank the Africa Center for the Strategic Studies and Kayat for having organized this webinar. I'm really delighted to be, to be part of it. Um, the SADC member states um, did a threat assessment on, on terrorism um, to develop the, the regional counterterrorism strategy. Um, three workshops have been conducted. Um, it was sponsored by the UN. And then the draft, the strategy was then approved in August 2015 by the heads of summit. Um, the overall goal of the strategy is to preserve the environment of peace and stability that will allow the member states to pursue their regional development and integration. Um, and then the objective is to, for the strategy is to provide a comprehensive framework for collective and coordinated action in prevention and combating of terrorism and related scourges. It is also aimed at enhancing cooperation and coordination among member states and with the regional and international organizations and partners. Um, in, during the development of, 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 of the strategy, the Africa Center, CAIAT, and the UN uh, CT um, assisted the SADC Secretariat in, in designing the regional counterterrorism strategy. And in, in line with the UN Global Terrorism Strategy the, and the UN Security Council and General Assembly resolutions and the OAU 1999 Convention and other relevant counterterrorism instruments. All SADC member states um, have been involved. Um, the representatives were from the security sector. Uh, it also included from the justice ministries in the, in the member states. The civil society organizations were involved, uh, as well as multiple regional and international stakeholders. Um, in, in determining the, the objectives, um, member states uh, considered the internal vulnerabilities that they have, as well as the external threats that were, that were identified. With regard to the internal vulnerabilities, um, member states identified the inadequate legislation that were existing, the lack of human and technical and financial capacities, the existence of porous borders, um, the lack of effective and consistent information sharing among security um, in agencies and the inadequate collaboration between the government and the civil society uh, organizations. Um, with regard to the external threats that were identified um, that also informed the decision to, to, to select or to identify key goals and objectives is the, the persistent terror activities uh, by Boko Haram in Nigeria and Al-Shabaab in Somalia and Kenya, the manifestation of the terrorism in the West, the North and East Africa, um, the, but more importantly, closer to the region is, um, as we all might, might recall, the August 1998 attack on the embassy of the USA in the Dar es Salaam. That is what that really has triggered for, for, for Tzadik 
to, to come up with the regional counterterrorism strategy and its plan of action. And it is built, the plan of action, the strategy is built on four pillars, um, uh, which is to consider measures to address the conditions uh, conducive to spread of the terrorism, measures to prevent and combat terrorism, measures to build state capacity to deal with this threat, and measures to ensure respect for human rights and the rule of law. I thank you, Iris. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think, you know, this is a good starting point, the necessity to have an assessment in place and, you know, developing strategy based on that. So let me ask the same question to Dr. Jeng. So what are the main features and provisions of the ECOWAS counterterrorism strategy and its implementation plan? Uh, more specifically, again, how was this strategy developed? How were the key goals and objectives identified? And who was involved in the process? And how? Over to you, Dr. Jeng. Thank you to give me the opportunity to speak and participate in this important seminar. I would like to start by uh, saying hello to my friend Idris, whom I have known for over 10 years, and my friends as well at uh, the Africa Center with whom I have also worked uh, and also this uh, the, at the uh, seminar in Somalia and with um, ACSS. So, so what do we have in terms of strategy in term at the ECOWAS level? I think in terms of peace and security, ECOWAS started in uh, 2015. We had a uh, few elements, security elements in place before that. And when we had the brutal uh, import of terrorism, we, we wanted to, to take a look and revise legislation to ensure regional security. And more and more, we, we noticed the phenomena of a deterioration of the security sector. Our region uh, had problems with drugs and, and we, we also saw crime rise and problems with governance inside the countries. And all of this worsened by uh, the, uh, the explosive uh, situation in Libya. So our populations remain vulnerable, it's easy for them to be radicalized, men, women, children, because of poverty, because of uh, the lack of work, unemployment, and the lack of services such as education. They, it makes them vulnerable also because of the explosion of information across social media and internet platforms. This, um, all of this has led to factors that accelerated extreme violence. And since the problem in Libya, we also have seen more attacks uh, that have actually caused more victims than the pandemic in the subregion. So the persistence of terrorist threats throughout the region has led to the mobilization of regional forces to bring adequate response to the problem. And therefore, our heads of state and the government put in place a political declaration of uh, ECOWAS. And in February 2013, put into place a program. So to be able to put into place this strategy, we use the methodology uh, that consisted of the following to uh, to call upon experts in the security sector and in, in 
South Africa, and they have given us uh, basic information to put to get the program started. And we have independent experts and all the institutions working in this field, such as CAIRT, uh, certain elements of the United Nations, everyone working vis-a-vis -vis terrorism were invited to take a look at our project and help us develop it. And then we were able to study this. We also made some interdepartmental changes and we sent this to the different member states to consult and give their advice. We also asked the Defense Department, security departments, agencies to give ideas on preventive measures and to work internally and uh, respond with comments on the situation. And the ECOWAS organized afterwards a, a meeting of government experts to adopt the different projects that were put in place. So after this period where the experts uh, of uh, governments worked on this, we received last year from our uh, certain institutions that are specialized in security. I also was representing the heads of the uh, armies. And we, we also included ambassadors, the Committee of Ambassadors. And then we went to the ministerial level the 28th of February and to have a meeting of the heads of state. And they declared, first they adopted this document at several stages. The main document was on strategies. It's a political, it's a policy declaration in the fight against terrorism. And the states declared zero tolerance. And this was adopted by this. It was officially declared and adopted. After the this first declaration, there were four amendments and regarding strategy and the fight against terrorism. The second instrument was to attach ECOWAS to universal principles in the fight against terrorism and, and ratification of all the member states of ECOWAS was required to adopt these instruments. And the third amendment speaks to the fight against terrorism put into place by the UN that should be followed. And in fact, the fourth annex takes us back to the fight against terrorism and the signature and ratification of all the member states was required. So the strategy in and of itself has three essential pillars. The first pillar is prevention. Secondly, uh, the, the fight. And then thirdly, reconstruction. And then the following up, the pursuit pillar. What we, so we have to completely reject terrorism, then eliminate um, conditions that are favorable to terrorism and then the strengthening, the operational strengthening of early warning systems to prevent terrorism from having access uh, to the space. And then we have to prevent radicalization. And then we have to promote um, democracy and the protection of human rights. Now for the second pillar, pursuit, we ask all the members to sign, to ratify and accept 
um, all the terms on the fight against terrorism. We have to strengthen rule of law, uh, the criminal systems. We have to improve the control and the surveillance of boundaries, of, of um, borders. And then we have to fight against uh, money laundering, terrorism. And then we must uh, help the creation of a judicial system uh, that is effective. We have to strengthen uh, the media. And then now pillar three is much simpler, um, but no less important, which talks about reconstruction and is dedicated to the protection of the rights of victims to support and reconcile communities and uh, promote uh, social cohesion, uh, the social contract. So this is basically uh, what our strategy has to do with and in integrates it in declaration and a series of Appendices. So the first appendix talks about strategy and, and the others uh, talks about the instruments that are in effect uh, regionally and internationally. But thank you very much. This was quite uh, useful. Uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, now based on your experience, um, what explains the slow progress for regional strategies such as those adopted by uh, ECOWAS and, and SADC in countering terrorism and violent extremism? Uh, what are the, or are the existing response mechanisms not adequate, as adequate as the threat that uh, they are meant to address? If, you know, we look uh, and we frame it within what's happening, you know, in both regions, SADC uh, region, in particular Mozambique, nowadays, and then the Sahel region, uh, which is part of, of ECOWAS. And uh, is it a problem of resource uh, constraints, uh, lack of shared uh, diagnosis or assessment of the nature of the threat and, and violent extremism challenges in the sub-regions, or is it just a lack of commitment? Uh, so what, uh, what, what do you perceive as being you know, uh, the difficulties in, uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, strategy development and implementation? Over to you, Dr. Solomon. Well, first of all, uh, Thanks so much for inviting me to this important meeting. If one accepts the AU's peace and security framework, the RECs are supposed to be at the bedrock of the continent security framework. Yet these have proved to have failed, unfortunately. The much vaunted African standby force has proven to be a paper tiger. Increasingly, it is ad hoc arrangements, which is becoming the norm. In the Sahel, it is the Sahel G5 work, uh, working in close cooperation with French Operation Bakan, troops and with the support of the US. In the case of Somalia, it is not IGAD, but AMISOM, and AMISOM has a strong extra-regional component, including 850 soldiers from Sierra Leone and a, and a police detachment from Nigeria. Um, uh, in the case of Mozambique, it was Russian and uh, regional private military contractors, and now US Green Berets and the Portuguese. Unfortunately, Sadiq did not feature in this unfolding tragedy. A group of weak states results in a weak sub-regional group and undermines the AU framework. The weakness is felt even more when there is no anchor state driving the process. Can one imagine the EU without Germany? Now, when we turn to Africa, Warren Christopher, who was President Clinton's Secretary of State, spoke of certain pivotal states stabilizing their respective neighborhoods. Fast forward to 2021, and these pivotal states are in serious trouble. And that includes Nigeria and ECOWAS in South Africa and SADC. More than a lack of resources or shared diagnosis of the problem, there just seems to be a lack of political will to decisively deal with the challenges posed by violent extremists and terrorists. I would, I, I would uh, like us to consider maybe just two case studies. The first is the events leading up to the formation of Boko Haram. The second, the events leading up to the Mozambican insurgency. Uh, you know, precedents to Boko Haram could be seen in the Matetsine uprisings in Kano, 1982 in Kaduna, and Bulumkutu, 1984 in Yola, 1985 in Bauchi. All represent an effort to impose a religious ideology on a secular Nigerian state in much the same way that Boko Haram is attempting to force Abuja to accept Sharia law, for example, across 36 states of the Nigerian polity. Between 1999 and 2008, 28 religious conflicts were reported. Um, turning to Mozambique, 
As early as 2004, there were reports of militant training camps in Mozambique. Between 2010 and 2013, there were training camps identified in Nampula and Tech provinces of Mozambique, run by Somalis, another by Pakistanis, a third by Indians and Bangladeshis. By the, by the early 2000s, some young men um, broke off from the Islamic Council of Mozambique to form Ansaru Sunnah. They built new mosques and madrasas and imposed a Salafist form of Islam in, in, in the areas. In 2015, the group attempted to enforce bans on alcohol and uh, stopping parents from enrolling their children to schools to be Western educated. So this echoes of Boko Haram here. Also in 2015, the local Muslim community uh, called upon uh, uh, the government to intervene after, after they stabbed a policeman to death. Um, all this was early warning, but there was no action. So why was there no effective attempt to stop the spread of this violent extremism, either nationally or, or um, across the regions at its, in, at its very inception? I do believe that we need to take these early warning indicators more seriously in future. We need to link it to a system of national and regional early action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed. Uh, so, Angelberta, um, let me come back to you then. What is the level of implementation of, uh, of the SADAC strategy? I'm keen to, to, to know, uh, you know the level of its implementation and what challenges do you see in the implementation efforts thus far? Uh, thank you again, Idris. Um, in order to implement and have a focused uh, implementation, the member states developed a roadmap, um, which is reviewed annually by the heads of the national counterterrorism centers. Um, clear objectives task has been set with timelines, um, which amongst other is the establishment of the national counterterrorism centers, the development of the national counterterrorism strategies, strengthening of border security, um, and capacity building. Mm -hmm. In that regard, um, six member states uh, have established the national counterterrorism centers. Three member states are using their current early warning, national early warning mechanisms to coordinate counterterrorism activities. Two member states are in the process of reviewing and restructuring the national counterterrorism models due to the demand of the current security situations in their in the respective member states. Um, and two member states are in the process of reviewing their national counterterrorism strategies. Um, one member state has finalized its national strategy to prevent radicalization and violent extremism with an action plan. Um, member states have also embarked upon public initiatives uh, to raise awareness on the dangers of terrorism, radicalization and recruitment through media campaigns and workshops and employment initiatives such as youth development and capacity building exercise have been carried out Member states have also enhanced collaboration and information exchange among law enforcement and security agencies. Um, however, um, there are still challenges that the member states are facing. Um, and one of them that has been identified is the budget constraints that member states have in implementing the, this, the, the, the regional candidate strategy. The gaps were also identified in the national capacities, uh, especially for detection, investigation, prosecution, and adjudication of terrorism related cases. Um, the vulnerabilities that the member states uh, experience at national level. You remember, I, I, I highlighted the issues of the porous borders, which makes the border security management a difficult task for the member states as well as the presence of active violent extremist organizations in some member states put neighboring states at the risk of becoming hosts of cells or training grounds um, for recruit joining uh, the groups. Therefore, um, I can say that the member states have really made significant strides in implementing 
the regional counter terrorism strategy. Um, although the process seems to be slow, but they, they, they are really um, trying their best to, to, to implement the, the counter terrorism strategy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Angelberta. Thank you very much. Let me just ask the same question to jo Dr. Jeng. I'm moving, you know, <laughs> straight into Dr. Jeng to give us some space, you know, for the audience to ask questions later on. So, uh, Dr. Jeng, uh, what is the level of implementation of the strategy at the uh, ECOWAS level, and what challenges do you see in the implementation uh, of it? Thank you for giving me the floor once again. Now, in terms of the recommendations uh, on the strategy, we developed an action plan. This action plan required that we create a manual on training uh, for the fight against terrorism. And then we had to establish uh, elements about uh, national legislation, uh, international cooperation in other topics. Now, at the regional level, what we did is we strengthened the capacities of the defense and security forces by organizing at least four regional trainings. Um, we did in national trainings on uh, transnational organized crime on terrorism. We did one in Benin, for example, and this was organized by ECOWAS, but we also developed a, an information system for West African police, a, which was a, the creation of a database at the uh, national, regional, and international level, which permitted the sharing of information and was associated with the AFIS system for the identification of fingerprints uh, at border post. And this system is currently uh, being developed, continues to be developed. And we have a system for early warning with specific indicators. Uh, there has been an evolution with, with the creation of the early warning centers. To, to work within this strategy created by ECOWAS. Uh, in terms of border areas, we created joint operations, and then we established a structure for maritime security, and then we created centers um, close to certain border areas. We led uh, awareness raising campaigns regarding radicalization and ex violent extremism in various areas. And, and also we led uh, awareness raising campaigns in Mali. And we've been working with member states uh, on a number of issues. Now, the fight against small weapons uh, was intensified based on our agreement on arms uh, for the uh, management, the storage of weapons, light weapons. We worked with Jabba, that you know, whom you know, uh, which has worked on um, money laundering and terrorism financing. We worked on the creation of studies on the financing of terrorism, then the creation of strategies to uh, for the fight against terrorism within each member state. Along with this, there has been a strong political mobilization of ECOWAS through its strategy on SAIL, but through and also through the declaration of Bamako, which took place uh, during the conference on the uh, situation in the SAIL in 2017. And then we adopted the Lomé Declaration on Peace, Stability, and the Fight Against Terrorism and, and Violent Extremism. This was adopted by the heads of states within uh, ECOWAS. There was the initiative of Dakar um, in 2019. Now, despite this, as you said, there is a challenge. 
facing us. There is first this challenge of political will. There is no state member within ECOWAS that has declared a zero tolerance policy towards terrorism. So this is an issue. Now, it, there has been a delayed handling of uh, the issue of terrorism, the handling of this by the member states. Now, terrorism has been since 2013, very few states have developed a national strategy. And there is a lack of application, therefore, of any strategy since 2013. And there is no um, clarification of what the instruments are. And there is weakness in terms of our defense and security forces. There's a lack of coordination between these forces. And there is a lack of information sharing. Uh, there is a lack of adequately trained personnel, um, you know, I deal with counterterrorism. And I, even today, I don't have enough program official program program officials to work with me on this. Um, and there is something that is specific to Sahel. We don't have a strategy. We don't have partners who coordinate their strategies. Everybody's got their own agenda. So that's a problem. So that means that today, even more than in 2013, our region is extremely vulnerable to terrorism, uh, which is growing and is destroying communities. And and there is an increased insecurity around the Gulf of Guinea. And so this is what we face, uh, despite having a strategy that we're trying to implement since 2013. All along. Uh, Dr. Um, Suleiman, uh, Hussein, Suleiman, yes, uh, Solomon. So now I'm calling you Suleiman for Hussein. I do apologize. Dr. Solomon, what practical measures can ECOWAS and SADAC take to help advance implementation? Uh, you know the way forward if we had to you know make any recommendations what practical measures do you see from uh, that point of view over to you uh, dr solomon thank you um first uh, i would just say i would i would i would give three points the first before speaking of implementation we need to ask ourselves do we have the right people in the right positions during the time of president ture in mali Recruitment into the armed forces required a, a relative at the level of a colonel or a general. The necessary skill sets did not seem to matter. Who you knew as opposed to what you knew was most important. Under the circumstances, should we be surprised that the Malian armed forces crumbled so spectacularly in 2012 at the start of the Tuareg Islamist insurgency and in numerous failures since? Yeah. These are lessons which I think South Africa also needs to take to heart. If you look at the revelations at the, at the Zondo Commission, South Africa's security services uh, are politicized and they have criminal elements within it. And if the intention is to successfully prosecute counterterrorism operations in all of its facets, this needs to be corrected. Second, for regional strategies to be effectively implemented, we all need to be on the same page nationally and regionally. Poor national responses result in poor regional responses. SADC and ECOWAS states and its regional bodies should have clear, unambiguous breath assessments and should, as a collective, know who the enemy is and arrive at national and regional responses which reinforce each other uh, and collectively respond to the threat. This is simply not being done. In Africa, with regional organizations not being empowered by its constituent member states, implementation takes place at the national level, despite homage to regional rhetoric. If effective implementation does not take place at the national level, uh, level there's sadly little that ECOWAS or SADC can do. Regional organizations need to be empowered by, con by its constituent states and these regional bodies will need to hold members states to account for non-compliance. This will mean the curtailment of some sovereignty, which frankly, these states are unwilling to do. Third, most national strategies, and I'm specifically going to focus on the military dimension here, are poorly formulated and disconnected with reality. 
resulting in a situation where the means, ways, and ends are neither aligned nor synchronized, let alone achievable. This results in fly-by-the-pants uh, plans being formulated to address these problems. Furthermore, the lack of intelligence or the discarding of intelligence to match a, spe a specific narrative has had a very negative impact on strategies and operational designs and plans. When two or more states who have poor national strategies are expected to develop a common regional strategy, the problem is magnified, resulting in giving the initiative and momentum to the bad guys. As strategy guides structure, most forces are not structured to combat current and predicted threats. Therefore, they are neither adaptable nor agile, and their lack of flexibility gives the enemy the advantage. African militaries are not preemptive due to a lack of discarding of intelligence using outdated and outdated equipment or equipment which is not maintained, purchasing of incorrect equipment, poor training focused on antiquated doctrines, poor C4I, and so forth. This results in a flip-flop attitude towards a robust response, which does not allow a unified campaign strategy with good communications and logistical support. What is needed is to develop a realistic intelligence-driven campaign strategy based on a whole of government and whole of society approach. The means must support the ends. Added to this is focused training, C4I, and a relentless offensive against the bad guys. Furthermore, the governments must dominate the informational environment and negate the enemy's access or override the enemy's messages. So this requires a media campaign to support the campaign strategy. For this strategy to be effective, the state has to be regarded as legitimate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, let me go back now to Angel Pekka. This uh, is the last round of, of questions. Based on what you uh, have heard and your uh, appreciation of the level of implementation of uh, the SATAC strategy, um, do you, um, how do you overcome these obstacles for effective strategy implementations? And I think, you know, Dr. Solomon did indeed, uh, you know, give us a, a good, you know, example or a number of, a set of good examples on how these strategies can be uh, enhanced in terms of implementation. But over to you, Engel Persa. There's a need for the, the establishment of the regional coordinating body to be expedited. Um, the regional counterterrorism strategy is due for review this year. Um, so to, to, to include emerging threats and to, to fill those gaps as was also raised by, by uh, as was also raised. So the, the review of the regional counterterrorism strategy will take place in September, uh, where all the, 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 the stakeholders will be invited to, to assist the region in, in, in strengthening um, the gaps in, in, in the strategy. Um, there's also a need for the establishment or enhancement of a dedicated cyber security response coordination in the region. Um, there's also a need for the enhancement of the implementation of the SADA coordinated border management guidelines. Um, there's a need for the agreed projects and programs um, that has been said with the international partners to be implemented. Um, the capacity building exercises to be, to be carried out to, to fill the gaps the, that was identified. And more importantly, um, there's also the need of, of strengthening the awareness raising on, on the threats posed by, by, by terrorism and violent extremism. So in a, in a, in a nutshell, uh, um, it, it calls for a, a robust, uh, 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 coordinated efforts to be to be to be carried out by by, by member states, but uh, um, and then to adopt uh, uh, um, strong measures that are in the, uh, for interconnectedness between the social economic and the and the security measures. Therefore, uh, uh, um, the member states the 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 the, the review that is that is set. Will, will be considering 
all, the, all those gaps that have been identified and, and, and then strengthen those gaps. I thank you. Let me just switch on my microphone. Okay, uh, Dr. Jeng, so this is my uh, last question today. Um, from uh, the perspective of, uh, of ECOWAS, how uh, do you anticipate uh, to overcome these, you know, the obstacles that uh, you shared with us uh, in term, uh, for, for, you know, a more effective strategy implementation? Over to you. Very good. Uh, in terms of the measures that we are undertaking at the moment, there is the meeting in which I am taking place in Cotonou. I am currently uh, coordinating a meeting of intelligence chiefs uh, at the uh, regional level. And so I left this meeting in order to come here for an hour. So this is done to really reaffirm the political will of our heads of state. They, since September 2019, they have adopted a, an action plan uh, for the period 2020 to 2024. So in terms of everything that is going on, we have put together, we have brought together civilian personnel, um, civil society organizations, security forces, intelligence uh, services, um, so that we could fight terrorism, not only through military means, but also through education. We've brought all the resources together and to establish an action plan, 2020-2024, and with additional components as well. And we've talked about the sharing um, of initiatives in the fight against terrorism. So there was, you know, we talked about these efforts that previously were not coordinated, especially in the Sahel. So the first element was to say, we need to pull our efforts, coordinate it, our initiatives. So secondly, we talked about the sharing of information, of intelligence among the member states. So this is internally, but also at the regional level, because one of the disadvantages of our states is that, you know, we have the criminal groups, uh, be they jihadists or be they um, traffickers, drugs, human trafficking, they share their information, they coordinate. So the strategy that we need to use is to have an effective sharing of information amongst ourselves. Now, the third element is training and equipment that is being used in this fight against terrorism. So you need to have the right people in the right place, but they have to be trained. And then we need to control the borders. The fifth element talks about the strengthening of uh, the control of small arms. Sixth component is the fight against the financing of terrorism. And the seventh is the promotion of intercommunity um, communication and the prevention of violent extremism. And lastly, we must mobilize the resources. Um, and to implement this action plan, we established a governance systems that had, system that has these three committees to implement this. Our, one of our first activities currently is this meeting that is taking place right now. And it's basically to bring together all the security forces, all the intelligence groups to bring, to come together and speak the same language and address this. It's a big challenge, but we're doing it. We also have the system of training the police through which we ask all security forces within each country to come together to have a basic database um, regarding crime and then the states will come together those who will share uh, 
information amongst each other within ECOWAS, and then also Interpol can uh, share so they can reach a global level on all of the members on the international level. And this is what the ECOWAS is trying to achieve to have also stronger willpower on the part of our states to uh, then also have regional cooperation. Thank you. It is I who, think, who thank you that we are in a situation uh, within which the strategy is uh, urgent. On which, you know, uh, you know uh, one has to, uh, to, to develop, but also implement the strategies. Uh, Dr. Solomon, please, let me uh, end with you by asking the last question. Um, what are some of the sound practices of strategy development and implementation uh, that would pertain to making uh, for better regional counterterrorism and countering violent extremism strategies? So over to you, Doctor. Thank you once again. Um, I think the first point we need to accept is that regional organizations cannot do everything which needs to be done. There is a need to focus their activities to prioritize, especially given the scarcity of funds and other resources. Since I focused on more operational issues as well as uh, uh, points of strategy in my, in my previous response, allow me to focus on three areas which in my view does not get enough attention and should focus the minds of policymakers as they develop strategies to combat the threats posed by extremists. These are gender, the environment, and conflict dynamics. I should say broader conflict dynamics. On the issue of gender, between 1979 and 2019, more than 160,000 lives were lost globally as a result of Islamist violence. In an effort to understand Islamist rage, Arno Tash provides deep insights on the social attitudes driving this phenomenon, utilizing data sets from Pew as well as the Gender Social Norms Index. Tausch concludes that restrictive gender norms are the decisive factor leading to the support of terrorist activities. Tausch's pioneering research has direct relevance to policymakers and has resonance with other scholars like Anila. Salman, whose own research has demonstrates that female actual advancement and equality in education, employment, and political representation are more effective in reducing terrorism. If we are serious then on putting the brakes on the Islamist juggernaut, we will need to promote gender equality across Muslim communities. Such gender equality cannot be embraced without promoting a more liberal Islam. A more liberal Islam, I want to stress here, cannot be co-opted by the state. It needs also, for its own legitimacy, to be critical of government. The second point I want to raise is the issue of the environment. Since no terrorist group can survive without financial resources, the disruption of these is an absolutely essential component of, of an effective strategy. This is a point highlighted, for example, by Kurt Steiner's work, with, where terror groups in Africa are involved in illicit activities such as taxation on illegal fishing and mining to ivory smuggling, where amounts as high as $300,000 are paid for 100 kilograms of ivory. Steiner also notes that 80% of all armed conflicts occurred in areas designated as biodiversity hotspots. So your national parks and so on. For regional policymakers, it is clear that these hotspots need to be prioritized. They cannot become ungoverned spaces. With drone technology become, becoming cheaper, et cetera, it is possible for even cash traps, uh, for, for cash trap uh, governments to have eyes in the sky over these areas. And then the third point is broader conflict dynamics. What is clear is that a close relationship exists between terrorism and, broad, and broader conflict. In 2019, for instance, 96% of all deaths resulting from terrorism occurred in countries already experiencing conflict. Terror groups exploit existing cleavages in their societies for their own ends. The socioeconomic and political alienation of the Tuaregs 
and their fight for an independent homeland was exploited by militants linked to, for example, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Similarly, Islamic State's penetration into various parts of Sub-Saharan Africa would not have been possible without the existence of already existing fissures and conflicts in society. This is borne out by the fact that the top 10 countries confronting the most amount of terrorist incidents have one crucial factor in common. They are experiencing at least one armed conflict. An effective counterterrorism strategy, however, is more than merely focusing against the, the threat posed by a particular terrorist group itself. It needs to reduce broader conflict dynamics in the country as a whole, since effective counterterrorism uh, um, is not only counterinsurgency, but also conflict resolution, economic development, political accommodation, and social inclusion. Conflict de-escalation does not only mean short-term measures like demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration of former combatants, but also entails structural measures which are medium to long-term in nature. There are worrying trends that political violence is becoming acceptable in the public discourses as groups feel that, they, uh, that there exists no institutional means for redress. This is especially the case where group grievance exists. Consequently, statehood needs to be less elitist, more popular. Statehood needs to be responsive, tolerant, politically and economically inclusive. This entails that the nature of governance needs to be transformed along more democratic lines. Such change will not be easy within the context of the fragile nature of, of the African polity, but it is essential if counterterrorism efforts is to bear fruits. The Global Terrorism Index is emphatic that governance is the most important factor that determines the size, longevity, and success of a terrorist group. In conclusion, I would like to, re I would like to reiterate my previous point. In order to fight terrorists and conduct a, con a successful CVE policy, sovereignty will need to be pooled. I do not think that African states want to do this, but there is no alternative. Why is there no alternative? Because regional security complexes are, are, are a reality, because terrorist groups are increasingly cooperating with each other, and because in the globalizing world, insecurity anywhere is a threat to security everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, doctor. And I have to say that um, you know, you're preparing a book on directions in international terrorism. Uh, which uh, takes into account some of these uh, aspects, in particular the sensitive aspect of sovereignty and uh, how it's dealt with within, you know, the sphere of, of counterterrorism. So um, again, you know, before handing over the floor to the participants, you know, I kept on taking notes and I do apologize. I have to, you know, uh, my eyes were flipping left and right because I had to look at you, the, uh, the chat room, and also uh, ensure that uh, I'm taking proper notes. There are a few keywords that were coming out of this discussion. First of all, assessment, threat assessment, creating the need for the development of a strategy. Second, the necessity to have a, a methodology. And I think this came out clearly. And the necessity to develop specific indicators for countering terrorism or terrorism and violent extremism. Uh, the necessity to have, you know, once you have a, a strategy and developed pillars, then to accompany the strategy with a plan of action. Uh, the necessity now, if we're looking at the regional, uh, you know, strategy to implement it and translate it into national strategies uh, with the respective uh, plans of actions, but also uh, with respect to support, financial support, institutional support. So maybe the creation of uh, counterterrorism centers uh, at the regional level, uh, national level, the development of training programs, the hiring of skilled individuals, but also investing in their tra uh, training and, uh, and so forth. And then the issue of review, which is quite important because, you know, as this was presented by our colleagues, is that the threat was something different from where it is now when the respective strategies were, were developed. But also the review of the strategy allows us to go back and fill the gaps, implementation gaps, or maybe challenges that have been perceived while implementing the strategy and its action plan. Difficulties, I would say challenges, political will. So the political will, not at the regional level, but at the national levels, how to translate the regional strategy into national strategies and plans of actions. The challenge of raising awareness, 
uh, the a challenge of actions taken by member states in the implementation. Uh, and then structural weaknesses, lack of coordination, cooperation, and, uh, and um, I would say duplicity of roles in, in regions. And I think the best example is, you know, West Africa and then what's happening in the, in the Sahel. So is it G5 Sahel, is it ECWAS? So the duplicity and then the duplicity and the multiplicity, I would say, of those intervening within a, regio a regional, um, I would say, geographic area. And then we have the right people at the right position. This is quite important. It's not because you know you have a title that means that you have the skills in, in order to you know uh, either to uh, oversee or supervise the implementation of the strategy or coordinate the efforts in terms of the implementation of of the strategy. Other challenges are the means that needs to support the objectives, and then the um, the um, let me see the mutualisation des efforts. So this will be the pooling of resources uh, within a regional but also national perspective. So these are basically, as far as, uh, you know, I, I was able to take notes, the keywords uh, and the clear messages that came out from our three brilliant, brilliant panelists. Let me move on now to the questions, and I have a living document uh, before me. We have, uh, you know, a number of questions. Unfortunately, uh, given the time allocated, we will not be able to uh, answer all of them. I'm picking three. So we have uh, our dear colleague, Anneli Botta. It's not because I know you that I gave you the privilege, but I think it has influenced my decision, Anneli, and, and it's always good to, to, to hear your perspective. Uh, your question is, my biggest concern working on developing strategies is the complete disconnect between strategy and reality. This is again uh, seen in Mozambique. Strategies acknowledge best international practices, but existing capabilities are kept out of the equation. Um, this question is, uh, is, is addressed to uh, our three panelists. Uh, so please, if you want to raise your hand before I start picking and choosing, but I'd rather to hear from the three of you. Uh, let me be a gentleman again. Uh, it's not always the case and start with Engelberta. So Engelberta, how can you strike? And the concern is strategy versus reality. international best practices and existing capabilities, again. Um, it is, for me, it's, 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 a, it's a constructive criticism. And I think those are, those are some of the issues or, uh, of criticism that will be incorporated or taken on board when we, when we review the, the, the strategy. Because when this strategy was, was crafted, I think the issues of, of, of Mozambique was not that pertinent then. So for me, I, I see it as, 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 an, as, a, as, a, as a constructive criticism that, that SADC must take on board and not to comment about it. Okay, good, good, thank you. Can, let me just uh, turn the question to uh, Jane and then uh, Dr. Solomon. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, thank you so much. So, um, I, I, yes, in the book that I was speaking of earlier, uh, she, we had a consultant um, with ECOWAS. It's a book that was, I don't know the impression that it gave, but it was developed based on concrete reality. So this is a book that took off from reality. And the methods that we have with ECOWAS um, to develop our strategies went through the help of experts. And then we had consultations uh, based on good practices with KR, with, with ACSRT. And then we went to review questions. So strategies of ECOWAS was a strategy that was extremely integrated with a number of different platforms. No, to include uh, the concerns uh, in terms of any state's reality. 
Now, the, there is a difference between what we say at a political or diplomatic level and what we actually think. Now, it's very hard to take into account all the actors who have interests. So this, you know, or a situation that is deteriorating or a situation that is improving, you know, who, who is profiting from the crime? That, that, that could be a question. So this is something that we have to take into account. When we when we talk uh, between, for example, people who are in work in intelligence or security, we, we tell each other the truth. And But what we say is also that sometimes what's most important is what is not said. So there are things we can say um, to understand reality because they, but there are things we cannot say in political documents. You know, and that's just a reality in the field. That's what happens. I, I hope I've somehow answered the question. Yes, indeed, I, I appreciate. Sometimes also, the, indeed, the strategies are, are, are difficult to, uh, to, to balance off with reality. Again, at the regional level, because you have so many countries that are not at the same level of the threat. So you want to make sure that you have a consensus around the document. Uh, but, you know, in doing that, sometimes, you know, the document could be biased and ill-informed, I would say, because you're taking into account this political correctness that uh, Dr. Uh, Jiang is, is making reference to. Um, let me just take a, a, another question. I'll take a francophone question. You know, I want to balance off. I, uh, alors, je vais poser la question. I will, I will switch to French. Uh, this is uh, cette question est de Monsieur. This question is for Mr. Ahmed Senf um, from CE from ICAS. In terms of the SADC region, the problem in Cabo Delgado seems to have very deep roots uh, that made the area favorable to terrorism. So you talked about strategy, but how are religious groups in the area involved in the search for solutions? The second part of this question is, can ECOWAS give us an example or two of actions for the elimination of conditions that are favorable to terrorism? So one in part of the question is addressed to SEDEC, the other to ECOWAS. To English? Yes. Okay. So uh, it says that in, concerning the ECOWAS region, uh, the problem in the Capo Delgado area or zone uh, seems to be very profound. Uh, profound et on rendu le terrain. Alors, ça semble avoir des origines. It seems to have, uh, you know, deep rooted terrorism, um, I would say, uh, roots. So the problem is basically a terrorism related problem. Um, and then uh, it says that the panelist has spoken about the strategy. How do you see, at least from a religious point of view, the involvement of the religious uh, leaders in the region uh, in the development of the strategy? So in terms of the, uh, the uh, SADAC strategy, have you consulted with religious community leaders in the development of, of the strategy uh, in that sense? You know, because you have a living now condition and situation. Uh, how would have that been the case if it was the case? And if not, is that to be considered? And then for ECOWAS, I think the question was in French, so Dr. Jiang can, uh, can speak to that one, uh, in terms of concrete examples of, uh, 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 of actions, uh, you know, for the elimination of the conditions conducive to terrorism. Voilà. So, Angel Berta, in, in terms of the involvement and the consultation of religious scholars. Uh, ah, so, uh, Dr. Diang, si, si je peux donner la parole à Angel Perta, et après on revient vers Dr. Diang, oui. So, uh, with ECOWAS, it's really a, a policy of breaking down um, isolation. So we're encouraging in every country the construction of infrastructure that will make it possible to link uh, schools that are 
uh, the most isolated or communities that are most isolated to the center because the vulnerability of certain populations is due to the fact that uh, that there are um, gaps in infrastructures for connecting areas. So ECOWAS is really focusing on this issue in order to allow the most isolated regions within our countries to be linked to the capital, to be less isolated, like you'll see it in Senegal, for example. So, and, and this is a, a, an essential policy in terms of the Casamance region. So this is really something to so to breaking down this isolation, building this infrastructure is really critical and you'll see it being done everywhere. And it has brought about some uh, relief for, for example, for women who are ill, who can get to hospitals or populations who can now uh, move, travel to urban areas. And we're doing the same thing. In, in, within ECOWAS, we developed an, an entire uh, department for education. And this is a department that is working on um, awareness raising uh, in terms of violent extremism and do, to do this within populations. And we're doing it in the north of Nigeria. Uh, and we're also doing it, for example, by supporting Malian authorities within their own countries. So as I said earlier, one of the main reasons for poverty and for the vulnerability of the populations, it's this lack of access to education. So by building schools, by opening e opening up access to education for young people, giving them a good, a better comprehension uh, of this, these messages. Uh, we are actually uh, eliminating this, this favorable environment for terrorism. So first there is indeed this infrastructure for connection and then education. Uh, this, these are the elements that we're focusing on in the COS region. For you, Mr. Dian, Dr. Deng, and uh, to Dr. Solomon. So I'll pick on Dr. Solomon uh, to give him the opportunity to, to answer this question. You brought up this issue of human resources uh, to work in key positions, you know, and uh, if you want to elaborate more about this, um, the question is saying, uh, my question is in a continent of extremely high unemployment rates of skilled people, it is a challenge of skill. Uh, is it a challenge of skill or is it resources required to employ much required skilled personnel? So over to you, Dr. Salim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is so many commonalities in terms of all of these particular conflicts. I, I am saying here that it, it's not there's a shortage of skills, but people are chosen because they are aligned in, in a certain uh, a political way. There was a question in the chat box about Idris Debi, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the Zagawa clan, 4% of the population controlling, controlling the rest of the population, people are being chosen because of, of these kinship networks or because the political party in power is now running patronage networks. The, the, this is a problem. Um, the issue of Cabo Delgado, which was raised, this is a complex issue. I don't even think it's just religious leaders because I think that Islam is a political uh, um, vehicle for different ethnic groups, for different political formations. Uh, um, and you see that across uh, uh, the region. Uh, across Africa, when you when you talk about poverty and uh, so forth, you know Cabo Delgado is 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 the poorest province in in terms of Mozambique. Uh, if you take northern Nigeria, uh, uh, the the poverty rate is seventy two percent, which is whereas in the Christian South it's twenty seven percent. If you take uh, Mali, it is sixty seven percent in the south. But, but, but in the North, for example, in Kidal, it is 92%. If you, if you, uh, and, and then very importantly, the issue of ethnicity, which is driving this conflict. Northern Mozambique has a different ethnic group from, from the Frelimo dominated South. 
uh, if you take Boko Haram, you can't separate the Kanuri identity uh, from this. If you, if you now talk about Ansar al-Din, you can't separate the Tuareg identity. If you are talking about, uh, about, uh, about the uh, Masina Liberation Front, but you can't talk uh, about it without talking about Fulani identity and so forth. So there are similarities here. And, I, 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 and I'm sorry to say this, but the people that I encounter who are in senior positions are there not because of their skill sets. They can't understand these things. Uh, uh, it, it, resources is a secondary problem. Having the right people in the right jobs is, is, is absolutely primary. If you don't have that, there is going to be no strategic uh, uh, implementation of any excellent policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just realized that I did not give the opportunity to Angelberta to answer the question. So Angelberta, if you want to, you know, take a stab at that last question, um, you know, briefly, and then uh, uh, we can wrap up for the day. I know, just bear with me another minute, please. Thank you. Thank you, Idris. Um, it, it, it is a requirement when the member states develop their national counterterrorism strategies that they include, that they take a whole society approach. Um, not only just the religious leaders, the traditional uh, uh, leaders or traditional authorities, the, the community-based organizations, well, women groups, youth groups. So all uh, it, it should be a whole society approach that needs to be taken. So that is a requirement for, for developing a national counterterrorism strategy. So they are indeed uh, taken on board. Thank you. They are uh, indeed because we've uh, we've facilitated so many of these national discussions where we brought together religious leaders, community leaders, civil society, women and youth, and so on, to the preliminary discussion of uh, developing of national city strategies and even at the uh, regional level. So yes, indeed, uh, I did not want to take that you know answer, but it's you know answer on your behalf. It's your region, so it's better you're in a better position to say that. But thank you very much. I would like to thank our brilliant panelists. This has been. Very very, very interesting, enjoyable. You made it so much interesting that we didn't see time fly. I wish we had more time and, uh, you know, to, 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 to really have an in-depth discussion and really respond to the so many questions we, we received on the chat. But uh, this just uh, indicates to us that this is a subject that we have to continue to address, you know, jointly with our colleagues from ACSS. And um, again, uh, we'll most probably be calling on your expertise to come and, you know, and, and, and give us and share with us your knowledge uh, in that sense. So thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you, uh, you know, together or, or even individually once the airports are open and we all get vaccinated. So stay healthy, uh, keep safe. And uh, looking forward to seeing you again. Uh, Anwar, I do apologize for, you know, extending this session, but let me just, you know, give the floor back to you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Idris, for, uh, for your great uh, moderation of this webinar. Thank you for our participants, as you said, for their brilliant uh, presentations. And thank you uh, to the many Africa Center alumni and distinguished colleagues and friends who have joined us today for this webinar. Uh, we look forward to continuing the discussion and then we will have more, uh, uh, you know, uh, upcoming events. So thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and, and stay well. Thank you. <laughs>